I need to start today by addressing the elephant in the room. Have you heard of the story about five blind men describing an elephant that they haven't seen before? For those unfamiliar, here's how it goes. Imagine five blind men trying to describe an elephant. The man holding the trunk of the elephant says, the elephant feels like a snake. And the one that is holding the leg, he insists that the elephant feels like a trunk of a tree. And the guy at the back, feeling the tail, he says, nope, the elephant is like a rope. While they're all touching the same object, their individual perspective is different. I feel in science, we often find ourselves in similar situations. In fact, biologists have taken a reductionist approach for years, breaking complex biological systems into simpler parts like studying a compartment of a cell, or a fragment of DNA, or a protein that it encodes. And when it comes to cancer biology, we study cancer from our unique vantage point, focusing on very specific details and interpreting them through the lens of our own expertise. While these approaches have provided powerful insights in the field, they often leave us with incomplete perspective, something that will not give us the big picture idea. But here's the good news, that script is changing. We now know cancer is not the disease of an individual gene, but it's actually a disease of the systems. So in the next few minutes, I'm going to explain how we arrived at this with way of thinking. But first, let's rewind 20 years or so. I'm talking about the time when Seinfeld was winding down, X-Men was hitting the box office, and if you had a flip phone, you're the pinnacle of cool. Now, during this time, if you have asked a scientist, how many genes are mutated in cancer? Their answer would have sounded something like that of a science fiction. No one really knew the answer. Back then, every cancer mutation that we discovered felt like a random piece of puzzle, all scattered on a floor from five different boxes, and none of them came with a picture that tells how to build it. That's how complex it was. And this complexity, demanded a revolutionary approach, and that is tumor DNA sequencing. This caused a paradigm shift in the field. Fast forward to today, of the 20,000 genes that define us, we now know it's only a handful of genes <clears throat> that steer the course of cancer. We call them as driver genes. But here's the inspiring part. We not only know the culprits of the disease, but we also have figured out ways to outsmart them, at least to some extent. What do I mean by that? Rather than classifying patients based on body parts, like the breast cancer patients go to the breast cancer clinic, we now look at the genetic makeup of the tumors and tailor treatments according to them, personalized medicine. In simple terms, if there is a blue gene mutation, give them the blue medicine. If there is a red gene mutation, give them the red medicine. But you might have guessed it right. Patients with the blue gene mutation don't always respond to the blue medicine. Why? This is one of the most pressing questions in cancer therapy. Interestingly, tumor DNA sequencing has revealed the response for that. A single tumor doesn't always contain just the blue gene mutations. It also has mutations in the green genes and the orange genes and the yellow genes and so on. This is called tumor heterogeneity. It's just a fancy way of saying not all of your tumor cells are alike. I like to think of them as bad guys. You know, bad guys with their own speciality. Some are like car thieves, breaking into the machinery of the cells. Others are like bank robbers, hoarding valuable nutrients. And then there are these hackers that disrupt the normal signaling pathways within the cells. Sometimes, some of these bad guys during treatment escape and the cancer comes back. So, here's the question. Is there something that is common for all of these bad guys? Are they dependent on something really common? And I believe the answer lies in an enzyme called telomerase. 
it is an enzyme that protects the ends of the chromosomes. It's like the super bad guy. And he's the kingpin that pulls all the strings for all these bad guys, okay? Now, what is telomerase? It is an enzyme that maintains the ends of your DNA. If you think of the DNA as shoelaces, telomeres are the plastic tips at the end of those shoelaces that prevent them from fraying. Telomerase is the enzyme that repairs and rebuilds those plastic tips. Normal cells don't produce this enzyme. Somatic cells, they have no telomerase. But cancer cells, they produce a lot of this enzyme. Now, we've known the role of this enzyme in cancer for over 30 years. But the challenge is to efficiently inhibit them. People have tried different mechanisms, and none of them has really worked very well. Just about eight months ago, FDA approved the very first drug to inhibit telomerase. This is a major breakthrough and a big step, but its application to other cancers still remains elusive. How do we tackle this problem? This is one of the questions that my lab aims to address. So I'll tell you a little bit about my background. Following my PhD at the University of Alberta, I did my postdoctoral training at the University of Toronto in systems biology. And that's where it hit me. Sequencing the tumor DNA alone is not sufficient. Rather than cataloging these mutations, we must understand how these mutations disrupt the vast interconnected network of communications that happens within the cell and between cells. And that's the key thing. Now, why do I say that? Let me explain. Imagine a city map. Usually, there are well-organized networks of streets and alleyways and so on. Traffic smooth, flows smoothly because the signal systems keep everything coordinated. Now, on the right, I'm showing you an image of a cell. Notice the similarity? You might have to squint a little bit. But instead of cars, you've got proteins running around as if they are late for work. Instead of traffic lights, you've got those genes that regulate the flow of information. And the links between them are the pathways that influence the cell's behavior. So in conclusion, cells are like microscopic cities, except they have fewer coffee shops. Now, if you look at cancer cells, look at the chaos. Their signals are highly misdirected and the pathways are deregulated. So in this context, just fixing one traffic light is not going to solve the problem. From this perspective, it's important to see genes not as isolated elements, but as part of the circuits within which they operate. This is why systems biology, the science of understanding these intricate networks, is very powerful. Let me just illustrate that a little bit more by zooming into the city, okay? Remember the car thieves and the bank robbers that I told you? The red cells and the green cells with those red gene mutations and blue gene mutations? Now let's just say they are trying to escape from the cops by getting to the airport, okay? Cops here, I mean the immune cells, the body's defense mechanisms. But here's the problem. If they make it to the airport, they're gone. Now, this means they have slipped past the defense mechanisms of the body, evaded the immune systems, and they have metastasized to a different organ. Then it becomes even more difficult to treat. Moreover, these cells, as I said before, are powered by the enzyme telomerase. It's like a getaway driver that actually fuels these cancer cells to move much faster and escape from these cops. And just like a city, there are multiple alternate routes that the cancer cells can actually take in spite of all these mechanisms, different mechanisms that we have in our body. They do still reach the airport and they, get, they escape. But this is the most in interesting part. If you have a map, you can track all the possible routes that the cancer cells are taking right? And you know exactly where to put that roadblock. Figuring this in a telomerase-producing cells can actually help us to overcome 
the major medical challenge of tumor heterogeneity. And that's exactly what my lab does. I mean, think about it. Map making has been one of humanity's ancient pursuits, much like our search for a cure for cancer. Now we are doing the same, but instead of discovering new lands, we're now charting the genetic landscape of the cancer cells. So let me show you how we actually do that in reality. Just like blocking the, each of the roads to prevent those cancer cells from escaping, we use the CRISPR-based methodology, the Nobel winning approach, that actually allows us to turn off every single gene within the genome until we find the ones that cancer cells absolutely can't live without. And that's the critical target that we are actually going for. And once you know that, then you develop drugs to shut them down. And that's the next stage of the research. All that said, we also know that there is no one single magic bullet for cancer. So we try to inhibit multiple pathways from the way we actually do our research because it gives you all the routes. And we inhibit that and try to develop combination therapies. And that's just the beginning. Discoveries like these are adding pieces to the cancer map. And so far, I can proudly say that we have built the map of Saskatchewan. There's more work to be done. The more we uncover, the clearer the path becomes to develop more efficient, personalized medicines, medicines that can save more lives than we currently can. I want to share with you a personal story. When I left India in the late 90s, I was filled with this nervous excitement, leaving behind my friends, families, my culture, everything that I'm really familiar with. It felt like stepping into the unknown. My dad, who has been a teacher for 38 years, recognizing this, gave me a piece of advice. He said, Franco, imagine you're in a dark room with a candle. The candle's light reaches just about three feet in front of you. You have two choices to make. You can stay where you are in the comfort of the glow, or you can take the step candle and step forward to see what the next three feet reveals. At that time, I didn't really grasp the wisdom of his words. But as I went through my life in science, I know how this philosophy has been my guiding light. In many ways, I feel the same principle actually guides my systems biology approach to cancer. Step by step, three feet by three feet, we're no longer blind men touching different parts of the elephant. We're mapping the entire beast. And with the right map, we just might find our way to a cure. Thank you.